Hey, so I'm, I'm from Dior. We're a group that runs ourselves as a dev shop that is a DAO that also has a legal entity attached to it. So we work on various client projects and also some internal projects like tooling, mainly around the DAO stack ecosystem. And we run ourselves as a DAO. And you can sort of think of us as an Upwork or a Fiverr that's owned by the freelancers who work for it. And so, yeah, we're a, a DAO that is revenue generating today and has a legal entity. And all of our funds are on chain and managed through the votes of the members of the DAO. And I can get into that in a bit. Uh, so yeah, what, first I'm gonna go through the formation uh, and then how we actually operate today and what we're trying to do in the future and how other people can also participate. So yeah, starting a DAO is simple. There's frameworks out there already to do this. So that's not the hard part at all. Even starting a legal entity is simple. You can go to Vermont's website or any state in the US and in other jurisdictions and use their online portal, portals and make, make a legal entity and within one business day you'll have a legal entity. Uh, but the tricky stuff that we did was that we wrote a long, not so long, only four page uh, operating agreement with lawyers in Vermont that essentially granted the, the company the source of truth for all of its governance, ownership rights, operations onto the DAO that we had launched. So we launched the DAO, we formed the company, and then we all signed an operating agreement that says that the rest of this company's existence is gonna be managed by this DAO, including all future members. So you'll see there's only three members at start. Today we have about 10, uh, but we don't have to go back and edit any documents every time a new at, um, member is added, anytime shares are distributed differently, uh, even amending the operating agreement or amending the rules of the DAO itself. We don't have to touch any paper for that. Only on-chain actions trigger those. So that's what we have today. We don't have any CEOs, managers, uh, employees. We're all contractors of the DAO and also owners of it. And so um, we basically earn compensation in both crypto, like ETH, DAI, USD, USDC, and also in shares in the company and reputation, what, what's called Reputation is non-transferable non voting shares. It's a primitive in the DAO stack framework that I can get into. So again, the formation is actually pretty simple. We open source our operating agreement so anyone can like fork Dorg and make their own or work with lawyers to make their own operating agreement. But the tricky thing we found is that after incorporating about uh, three months ago is actually running this, oper running this entity and running the DAO and keeping it synced up with the entity so that they don't get like out of whack and that the whole thing is legible. So if there's any disputes, it can all be handled and you can read from on-chain data and know kind of the history of what happened. So first off, I'll talk about legal agreements. So in our operating agreement, it states that no member of the DAO can unilaterally enter the whole entity into um, a, a legally binding agreement. Everything has to go through the DAO's proposal. And so if you read our operating agreement over and over in different ways, it just says, and this will be handled by the processes of, of the DAO. And this will be handled by majority of the DAO. And so we don't have to even give a lot of details in our operating agreement of how it functions because it can evolve and self-amend. And the, the actual paper, the English language, doesn't have to be changed. So what does this look like? I make a proposal in Alchemy, which is DAO Stacks UI. You know, I want to enter into this subcontracting sub agreement to build this um, identity DAO for this client. And so we link to an attachment. Right now we hold our documents in GitHub, so our uh, legal agreements live in a, in a repository in GitHub. And so we do a pull request to the, to the repository. We link to the pull request in the proposal. And once the proposal passes, we merge the, the pull request. So the uh, legal agreement gets added to our repository and it's now considered an executed legal agreement by our company via our DAO. So here's other examples. Some of these were kind of like just tests, like we tried to purchase a t-shirt with a bill of sale. Uh, some of them are more serious. This is an actual, the top left one is an actual um, major client of ours. And then also you can amend uh, legal agreements. For example, we, we launched as manager managed LLC and then um, amended it to member managed. And this has legal force, the fact that this passed our DAO um, and again, this attachment was to a pull request to add a legal agreement to our GitHub. 
And then there's also the more kind of normal stuff that you do with a DAO, like making a proposal to get paid for doing work. And so we have our own internal pro processes for like budgeting. So you know, money's coming in from different clients. We budget it out to all the projects that we want to work on. And then in a private GitHub repository, we're all assigning ourselves work. And then you make a proposal at predefined checkpoints to get paid. Uh, and, and so we're, a, again, we're a cooperative of freelancers, of independent contractors, so everyone can work whenever they want, wherever they want. So sometimes we have some people who do only part-time, some people only full-time, some people who are very variable. And so these amounts just reflect, uh, basically we keep the, one, one interesting design kind of feature that we um, had to consider was transparency versus privacy. So we want everything to be transparent to members of the DAO, but we don't want necessarily people outside of our DAO to know how much all of us are making and to know how much clients are paying us. So you, this is the public information, but it links to a more detailed uh, spec of the project in our private GitHub repo. We also have various uh, incentives, like um, if any of our agents or actually anybody in the world refers a client or refers a contributor to Dorg, we'll give them some small percentage of the amount that the contributor makes or that the client pays. So in this way, we want our DAO to be self-propagating and not actually need any administrators or dedicated uh, biz dev people or admins. And again, this is just something that DAO stack natively enables, which is upgrading the code of your DAO. So any changes to the DAO software do not need to be then updated in the legal agreement. The legal agreement is just pointing to the smart contract, to the original address of the DAO. So where are we today? This is all kind of confusing to most people and to us especially. So we think that there's a lot of ways that the tooling around this could improve, first off. The whole pro flow I explained to you with GitHub is messy and it only works because we're all developers and we know how to um, handle pull requests and all that. But what we're working on now is having a legal agreement uh, dashboard where it would be stored persistently on something like IPFS and versioned so that you can always know the latest version of all the legal agreements that the DAO's entered into. And this would be really important not just for the members while they're uh, working for the DAO, but also if there's a, a dispute that arises and the DAO has to go to court, uh, and there needs to be a record that's easily viewable of agreements that it's entered into. Taxes are, are tricky, but we have um, lawyers who have designed our entity to basically um, account for its own uh, inflows and outflows and then have a really simple report generated at the end of the year. But again, the UX around this stuff needs to be better. One way that we're going about this is uh, by creating a metadata standard for, um, for uh, what's up? This is a, an LLC, yeah, yeah. It's a BB LLC, which is a new entity in Vermont that they created that I can get into if, um, if we have time. So, so something as simple as this, um, if every if different DAOs that wanted to be read by these dashboards, regardless of what protocol they're using, it could you know, render their, the agreements that their members have entered into and then basic legal information like a, a mailing address. And yeah, we're slowly compiling these kinds of things and as more experiments happen, maybe there could be a broader archive. Yeah, and so the main point I wanna make is that more people sh should try this um, in all sorts of different jurisdictions with all sorts of different entities. It's not that like hard if you have a lawyer to just point whatever you're building to a DAO. Um, I'm sure there's complications in different areas. I'm not gonna, this is not legal advice, but we need more experiments because if DAOs just live on chain, then they're not gonna have access to the 99.999% of economic and political activity that happens in the world that's managed by corporations and governments. And so the, the crucial thing that we're able to do that um, maybe another DAO can't do, is we can enter into legal agreements and we can give someone our tax ID and we can give someone our company ID and that's stuff that corporations demand if you're doing business with them. And if I, in my opinion, if we just focus on fundraising um, and grant giving, we're not gonna be connected enough to the global economy to kind of get over the adoption wave. So yeah, like I said, the agreements are open sourced 
including um, also some service agreements with contractors and other agreements. Um, a partner of ours, OpenESQ, is a team of um, legal hackers, and they've also helped compile this template library. Thanks. Hey, who's got some questions for BBLLC? <laughs> Where should we start? Awesome. Great presentation and great start, seriously. Uh, one question I have, in fact, I have three, but I'll just go with one for now. Um, and I'll probably start with the worst question, legal liability. So if something goes wrong, that is in generally in the insurance space, there's a director's insurance that saves them. In this context, if you're insuring, are you insuring everyone? Are you insuring only the top one? How is the insurance work uh, for the corporations here? Yeah, we don't have insurance. Um, we haven't explored adding insurance, but in our legal agreements with, for example, um, clients, it has clauses that sort of limit the amount of um, liability that the company might have. But uh, so other than that, we have the same liability uh, shield as any other corporate entity. Everyone's uh, an owner, so it's in an LLC, it's called a member, but it, it, just for having any amount of reputation in our DAO, so you have 500 voting shares, I have seven voting shares, our operating agreement specifies that anyone who has any amount of voting shares has one ownership share. So we don't actually use profits as a way to get capital out of the entity. It's a pass-through. Everything that is coming in from clients gets distributed to the people who do the work for the clients. So if, if I understood right, some of the revenue goes towards this, uh, like uh, internal tooling or like promotion of brands. Uh, currently, can you share any numbers? Like, uh, how much is that in terms of percentages or volumes? Yes. Yeah, so we, we have something that we call internally our internal ops budget, which funds stuff like that that aren't necessarily client projects. And I think it's probably on the order of five to ten percent. And we're an early company, an early DAO that's still proving ourselves. So as we sort of deliver on more projects and have a, a wider portfolio, we can scoot that margin up to fund more of our projects. Um, but yeah, for now, we mainly do client work. Yeah, so in July of 2018, Vermont's legislature passed this BBLLC law, blockchain-based LLC. And it essentially carved out a new legal entity that says that if you specify that your organization is a BBLLC, you, there's only like five or eight different things you have to specify, like the blockchain you're on, the address, the um, security protocol, something goes wrong. And then you can um, have the material operations of your company, the governance, the ownership, managed on shares uh, on chain without having to come back and um, do anything to the agreements. And so. That's really nice for us because it just means our paperwork is very lightweight. You can go to our repo and see all our uh, public documents. It's very short. In total, we have like four or five pages that define our organization, and we never have to, to touch that. And the BBLC carves this out so there's certainty for founders to go and use it. But presumably, you could actually do something similar in other jurisdictions. And I've, I've heard of other states in the US that are moving to copy this jurisdic this um, legislation and have a BBLLC for, for various other states. A state like, yeah, just another, yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure. That Open ESQ is a group that we work with and they did an LLC in New York. And if you can read their agreement, it's also open sourced, but um, they had a real, really different approach from us. Like, uh, it's, it's like, to like apples to oranges, but you can really get creative, I think, if you have the legal counsel um, and you can say, because LLCs, the whole point of them in the first place, I think they were invented in the 70s, is, is to limit liability, but in a flexible, unopinionated way. It's up to the organization to specify the nuances of their governance. So, so I don't see a reason why you can uh, do this in other states, but you wouldn't have the certainty. You wouldn't know if the courts would uh, enforce it. You wouldn't know if, the, if banks would like give you a, an account with in Vermont, you know for sure the legislature explicitly stated uh, that this is allowed. Would 
Yeah. Was it smooth? It, I mean, the formation itself is really easy. You can even use the online portal to do it, I think. But the making the operating agreement, we, we did that r in really close collaboration with our lawyers so that they understood the nuances of how DAO stack works and how our DAO stack DAO in particular works. And making sure that the language in our agreement reflected that was a, a long back and forth. I think that it'll get quicker once a couple more examples are out there, because then you can just fork them, change a couple uh, sections. So it, it can it ranges. You you could do it really quickly, but you'd probably be risking more because you probably wouldn't have uh, made it actually fit what the uh, what the software is doing as much. So. Uh, what would be the incentive for a state to actually go and change the law or do the amendments for DAOs to have the possibility? My understanding is that states, at least in the U.S., make uh, it improves their economy. They make fees off of the registrations that the companies do. So they're constantly competing to have better laws for companies to go and incorporate there. I know Delaware is the dominant one in the U.S. The Delaware C Corp is really popular, and the state of Delaware benefits immensely from that. Wyoming, Nevada are other popular uh, LLC jurisdictions. So I do think there's a bit of uh, jurisdictional arbitrage where they want more companies to go through them. Thanks.